And now I'm very pleased to introduce tonight's speaker. Edward E. Baptist is an associate professor of history at Cornell University. Originally from Durham, North Carolina, he's also the co-editor with the late Stephanie Camp of New Studies in the History of American Slavery and with Lewis Hyman of American Capitalism, a reader, ebook and print on demand from Simon & Schuster. The LA Times calls The Half Has Never Been Told an ambitious new economic and social history of antebellum America. And Peniel Joseph, director of the Center for the Study of Race and Democracy at Tufts University, writes that it is a true marvel. Groundbreaking, thoroughly researched, expansive, and provocative, it will force scholars of slavery and its aftermath to reconsider long-held assumptions. We're very pleased to bring the conversation to Harvard Bookstore tonight. Please join, in, join me in welcoming Edward Baptist. I'm just going to turn this on as a, a stopwatch so I don't go on too long. Um, but I'm, I promise it's silenced. All right. So thank you all for, for being here uh, to meet the Economist's favorite author of the week. Uh, some of you may have heard of that. I'm not going to talk directly about that yet, uh, but um, if you want to ask questions, we can, we can get into that a little bit later. Um, I'm, I'm really happy to be here. There's some old friends who are here, people I haven't seen in a, a long time, and so, so that's, uh, that's pretty cool. Um, all right, let me, let me just get into it. Let me try to describe the book a little bit. Well, this book, uh, in one sense, is the story of two bodies. In the first body, uh, and I lay the, the, the whole book out, as you'll see in, in just a moment, uh, as a series of metaphors uh, based around the body. But the first body was the new kind of slavery that emerged in the young United States right after it achieved its independence from the British Empire. Although at the end of the American Revolution, slavery looked to some observers as if it would disappear along with the new state's other colonial institutions, it did not. Instead, enslavers like revolutionary war hero Wade Hampton of South Carolina transformed the institution. Once those innovators learned how to produce cotton with slave labor, cotton fiber became the most important commodity of the Industrial Revolution. As world demand for cotton grew after 1790, Enslavers began to move enslaved African Americans south and west by the thousand. The victims of those forced migrations were people like Charles Ball, a young Maryland man sold to a slave trader in 1805. The trader, who Ball eventually named, learned was named McGiffin, chained Ball to 51 other people and then marched them all 400 miles to South Carolina. And that's where McGiffin sold Charles Ball to Wade Hampton. Divided by 400 miles of marching from his wife and children, Ball had also not seen his mother since her sale to a slave trader a few years before. And now Wade Hampton and his overseers would try to separate him from his very own self. Using work management techniques as ingenious as anything modern experts could imagine, except that these were backed up with brutal whippings and other kinds of torture, they forced Ball to reveal exactly how much work he could do if he went full speed from daybreak to dusk. And then the next day, and the next day, and the next day, and so on. They pushed him to work even faster, always with the threat of a bloody, horrifically painful, skin-shredding cowhide whipping hanging over his head. And over the next few decades, what happened to Charles Ball would happen again and again. By the time enslavers finished seizing millions of acres in the Mississippi Valley from the Indians and buying millions more from European empires like France, cheap cotton made by ever more efficiently by enslaved African Americans was becoming the key raw material of an unprecedented transformation that we remember as the Industrial Revolution. Eventually, this massive economic change would raise millions and then billions of human beings' standards of living, moving them out of rural subsistence agriculture and into factory-focused work. While this change has challenging implications for the future of every species that lives on this planet, there's no question that the modernization of human societies has brought great benefits to many humans. But for Charles Ball, whose ever more efficient cotton labor was one of the foundations of this vast pyramid of transformation, it brought little but pain, and he was not alone. By 1860, enslavers like Hampton had moved over one million enslaved people. They now controlled 80% of the world cotton market at its most important point, uh, the British cotton market, and had helped make possible in Britain and in New England as well a revolutionary factory system that changed forever how human economies worked. 
Now, as a writer and a historian who was trying to get a handle on this massive phenomenon, uh, I was inspired by the novelist Ralph Ellison. And he described American history in an essay as a vast drama being played out on the body of a Negro giant, to use his terms. Ellison's metaphor seemed to describe the experience of people like Charles Ball. And in fact, to describe all of them together in a way, the body made up of all the enslaved bodies that were being bought and marched and exploited in the sources I was reading, plantation ledgers, slave traders journals, newspapers full of slave sale ads and runaway ads, all of them were, uh, all the people being described there were in a sense uh, a giant metaphorical body. And they were part of a system that was supposed to work together, and that was being stretched across new states and territories and across the decades of rapid American expansion. And everything that enslavers like Hampton tried to do was an attempt to turn enslaved African Americans' bodies against their own interest. So they measured Charles Ball's cotton picking rate and demanded more until he had to race left hand against right hand in a nonstop rush to survive the working day with an unstriped back. And as I wrote, I saw that you could dramatize the image of all of these relationships that enslavers were creating as parts of a body, feet for the slave trade that marched people south and west away from everything they'd ever known, everything that gave them strength and love. Right hand and left hand for the way uh, that Charles Ball's uh, creative abilities at work were extracted from him. Seed for the way entrepreneurs figured out how to tap world credit markets for the financing that allowed them to buy ever-growing armies of enslaved migrants. And backs for the way that by the 1830s, the system, the great big interlinked body of innovations and relationships, was building the wealth of Wade Hampton on the backs of enslaved people. Whites in the cotton states were on average far wealthier than those in the rest of the United States. And the health of all Western countries' economies depended to no small extent on the price of cotton. But what about the second body? And that one is the body of African America itself, a culture and identity formed in no small part in reaction to the creation of the body exploited by the corporate relationships created by enslavers and financiers and politicians and factory owners and consumers. Western culture has acquired over the last 200 years a couple of metaphorical ways to think about people whose bodies are controlled and forced to work against their own control and interests. One is the zombie. Now this word entered U.S. culture on a large scale after U.S. Marines occupied Haiti in 1915, and it's gone on to become a staple of horror movies and literature. But the concept in Haiti, at any rate, was really, I would argue, a commentary on the history of slavery. Supposedly, some Haitian Vodun practitioners can use spells and potions to kill a person and then raise them up as a willless body that moves and acts but isn't really alive anymore. And I would say that on one level, this zombie story is really a myth about slavery, which of course uh, the Haitian people also endured, a system in which powerful white wizards created rituals of social death, as the anthropologist Orlando Patterson memorably put it, describing the ways slaves could be separated from their people and their own control over their own bodies. And likewise, we can see how forced migrants to the cotton frontier like Charles Ball, though they were already enslaved when they were bought by slave traders, were pushed through rituals of social death, like separation from family and sale. And we can see how they could feel in the cotton fields they might be moving, but they were no longer truly alive. Well, U.S. pop culture zombies, what U.S. pop culture has done with the zombie myth, um, actually looks to me more like a replay of slave revolt horror stories. Uh, the kind that, that gripped 19th century white America with anxiety from time to time. And those faithful servants suddenly turned into murderous, irrational rapists, just like American zombies are well known to do. Uh, but maybe it's no accident that the zombie trope in U.S. popular culture took off in the mid-1960s as images of black power and urban riots occupied white America's television screens. But that's a, a digression. In the 19th century, the zombie body that African America was in danger of becoming as cotton slavery expanded was more like the classical Haitian formulation. By the time Charles Ball, separated from the family and the hope for freedom and the pride in his own labor that had made even a life in Maryland slavery worthwhile, was toiling down one cotton, by the time he was toiling down one cotton row after another, all day long, becoming the equivalent of a zombie was a real possibility for him. And not just for him, but for all African Americans who endured this. As the power of enslavers grew, so too did their ability to render not just individuals, but a whole gulliver body of African America dead in spirit, its components dead to one another, enslaved forever in a body that served their captors. But there's a 